What's going on guys? Josh here from Polymathics and today I want to give an informative brief and so what I'm going to do is give you information on something that you may not know. So with that being said let's just get right into it. Sex is not what we're talking about today but now that I really have your attention let me ask you a question. What do Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo, and Oprah Winfrey have in common? Have you guessed it? Yeah, some of them were rich and successful, but they all were polymaths. Do you know what that word means? Anybody out there? Okay, so, well, welcome to my channel. It's all about polymaths. But the term, according to Wicca, <clears throat> according to Wikipedia, the term comes from the Greek. Two root words, poly, meaning multiple, and mathos, meaning subject. So in the Renaissance, this term referred to individuals who had expertise in multiple fields. Your Renaissance man, your everyman, your universal man, right? The perfect courtier. And in Machiavelli's point of view, the prince. Now, you may be saying, well, why, why is this relevant to me? I believe that today, more than any other time in history, we face complex problems. Problems that don't have easy solutions. Problems like world hunger and global warming. Problems like the education crisis. And future problems like how to terraform different planets in our solar system so that one day we might get off this rock. Those problems do not have an easy solution. There is no one person that's going to come and solve those, right? It's going to require a multifaceted approach, a polymathic approach. Now, I understand some of you may still be like, well, listen, those things are really big issues. I'm never going to face them in my lifetime. Why should I care? Well, maybe this sobering fact will will wake you up. Maybe it, maybe it will give you an idea of why it's so important. According to the New York Daily News, since 2008 and up until last June, over 7.6 million jobs were lost to technology. Now, what does that mean? That means that jobs that humans were doing are now being performed by machines. Now imagine what that means. 7.6 million. Let's put that number in perspective. There's roughly 5.1 or 2 million people who live in the state of Maryland. That's more people than live in the state of Maryland lost their jobs to machines. So what does that mean for you and for me? Now I hear a lot of you guys out there shaking your fists saying this is a travesty. And maybe from a certain point of view, sure, it is. For those people who, who are not prepared for the future. Because I hate to tell you this, but let's get real. This trend is only going to continue. Those numbers are only going to get bigger. You have to get real. So that's why this matters to you. But the polymaths out there, they see this news and they think this is great. This is an opportunity. Why? Because, see, they know that if the computers and the robots are left to do the mundane, repeatable tasks, are left to memorize dates and equations, what that does is it opens humans up to do the things that they were created for, the things that they're best at, the things that separate them from every other creature that live on this planet. Creativity and critical thinking. Now, I know what you guys are thinking. Okay, well, that's all fine and dandy, but I could never be a polymath. I'm no Einstein. I'm not a genius. I can't do that. Well, I have good news. You don't have to be a genius to be a polymath. That's not what it's about. It's simply 
a different way of looking at the world, right? A different way of facing problems and challenges. And so today, what I really quick want to go over are three different areas where polymaths take a different approach to their problems. And those three areas, very quickly, are the questions that they ask. They ask the challenges that they face and how they face them. And the failures that are inevitably going to come and how they overcome overcome those failures. So, with that being said, let me ask you a question. How many of you like to watch movies, read books, listen to music, play video games? Okay, now, how many of you know a teenager or someone maybe even younger who can do all of those things while talking on the phone and walking to wherever they're going? right you've seen that before and I know some of you guys are like they would you want to go up to that 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 kid and be like why why but you see not too long ago a very well-known polymath by the name of Steve Jobs didn't ask why he asked why not and when he did he was able to invent one of the greatest innovations that has ever hit mankind. He changed the way humans interacted with themselves in the world. He ushered in a new era of understanding and, and innovation. But how did he do that? All of you are thinking, well, yeah, but Steve Jobs is really smart and he's, he's very creative. No more smart and no more creative than you were. The thing is, is that he looked at a problem and he asked better questions. Any of you who have ever watched Tony Robbins know, like one of his mantras is to ask better questions. If you want a better answer, you have to ask better questions. So it's a simple shift from instead of asking why, ask why not. Instead of asking <clears throat> uh, how is this possible, ask how can we do this different? How can we do it better? How would this be done in the future? And when you ask those questions, you're going to get better answers. Answers that could change the world. <coughs> but, so that's the first thing I want to talk to you about. But, but that leads me into the second item, which is the challenges that you're going to face if you decide to go after these dreams. You see... People aren't going to just let you come in and make this ruckus without giving you some sort of pushback, right? And so, so in order to really illustrate this idea, let me ask you a question. Did you know that Christopher Columbus and the Terminator have something in common? That's right, and I'm not even joking. You see, Christopher Columbus came from a very lowly place in life. His father was like a cheesemaker. And over the course of time, you know, he, he kind of built his reputation and he started mingling with courtiers and, and kings and queens. But throughout the whole time, people told him, you're never going to achieve that goal. You're never going to reach that dream. And as we know, as history would tell us, he sailed the, the seas and found the new world and gave us a whole new idea that one the world's not flat and two that there's other things out there other things to explore he broke the mold now what does this have to do with the Terminator now what many of you guys may not know is that Arnold Schwarzenegger also came from a very lowly place in life um, he wasn't expected from the small little farm town that he came from to amount to much. But he wanted to be a bodybuilder. And his family told him, no, no, no. They even sent him to the military to try to stop him from this. But nothing would stop him. He Every time someone told him, you can't do this, he embraced the challenge. He thrived off that. He wanted to prove them wrong. He wanted to show them that not only could it be done, but he would be the first one to do it. And so as we all know, he became one of the most renowned bodybuilders of all time. 
But then after that, he said, that's not enough. I want to be a movie star. I want to be a movie actor. And so <clears throat> people told him, Arnold, you can't do that. You're a bodybuilder. Your English is terrible. And you wouldn't even fit on the camera anyways. We need someone smaller, you know, to uh, someone like Humphrey Bogart. That's the kind of person that, that, that works in movies. He said no. And he embraced the challenge. And what happened? Well, we all know. He became one of the greatest movie stars, one of the most famous movie stars of all time. But then he said, no, I'm not going to stop there. He said, I want to be a politician. And again, he was told, no, you're just a movie actor. You're just a bodybuilder. You don't know anything about politics. And some may argue that that's still true. But he embrace the challenge he drove through each and every single roadblock that they gave them and he knocked them over and he said no I will show you that this is possible he also said I'll be back but the point is challenges are gonna come your way and people are gonna tell you it's impossible and when they do that's when you know you've got something good that's when you know you have a goal that's, that's worth achieving so that you can prove them wrong and so that you can be the first one that's ever done it. If you're the first one, there's nobody else behind you. There's nobody else in front of you. You stand alone atop the mountain, king of the mountain. But that leads me to my third topic of discussion, which is failure. You see, if you're going to ask big questions and you're going to take on challenges, then inevitably you're going to fail. And failure is okay, but a lot of people, failure is the end of the line. That's where they stop. That's where they say, oh, well, I guess I wasn't cut out for this. And they turn around, put their tails between their legs, and they head out. But see, polymaths take a different approach. What if I told you that both Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and Oprah all came from places of failure all came from from really difficult spots and and kept at it until they achieved their success Walt Disney was denied 300 times by 300 different banks before he received the loan that he would use to create Walt Disney World can you believe that we would have no Disney World today Millions and millions of kids would not have their eyes lit up to, to the, all these beautiful, wonderful stories had he not persevered. Now, this leads me to one of the greatest examples of all time of the polymathic mindset when it comes to failure, which is Thomas Edison and his invention of the light bulb. You see... Rumor has it, legend has it, that it took him anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 attempts. And who will ever know? You know, some of that is probably hyperbolic. But everybody agrees that it took him roughly 1,000 attempts, if not more, to come up with a light bulb that actually worked. Now, back then, someone was smart enough to ask him the question in an interview. They said, how did you deal with all that failure? Why didn't you just give up? And he said, no, no, no. I found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb. And you see that therein lies the nuance. Therein lies that fine line between the way normal people look at things and the way a polymath looks at things. You see, polymaths see failure as building blocks. They're little breadcrumbs that if you take your magnifying glass out and you follow the trail like a good detective and you follow the trail continue down the path and you never stop you will find the solution and then you'll know in future uh, endeavors which way to go that my friends is the key to the polymathic mindset those three things to ask bigger and better questions to take on challenges right head on embrace them and to embrace failure and look at it as, as a, a building block. Look at it as some, something that's going to lead you in the direction of the solution you're looking for. So let me leave you with this, and then I'll, then I'll let, let you go. Every time 
you see one of these. One of these little tiny things that seem so insignificant to us because they're everywhere. They're ubiquitous now. I want you to think. I want you to turn the lights off. Put a light a match and uh, light a candle. Turn the lights off. And I want you to think. What would the world be like now? If Thomas Edison had decided not to ask better questions. If he had decided not to take on the challenge that everybody else said was impossible. What would happen if he had stopped at his first failure? His second, his third, his 999th, his 9,999th. Where would we be? Where would the world be without the polymathic mindset? Okay, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Until next time, take it easy.